good morning, everyone. Of course, Pastor Q, thank you guys for joining us for our 9 a.m. service here at Word Movers this morning. We thank you guys for being a part of our broadcast this morning. Allow us to uh, come into your homes, your phones, your laptops, whatever it may be. So we thank you for uh, your attendance this morning. May God bless you with the word this morning. We're going to have our scripture reading this morning. It's going to come from the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 23. I ask everyone to either mute or silence their phones. You don't have to turn them off. I mute them or silence them. Vibrate whatever is best for you. Um, the song will come out of Psalm chapter 23. Uh, I'll tell you, it's in verse 5. Yeah. Matter of fact, just read the whole uh, Psalm 23. It's not in there. So, Psalm 23, we're ready to Psalm 23, then we're going to uh, teach them the word this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Psalms 23 reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 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 Praise God. May the Lord add a blessing to the hear and doer of his word this morning. Amen. 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 Praise God. Let's, uh, let's go into a word of prayer. We're going to ask God to be able to lead us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for blessings and keeping us in all things. Thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Father God, for what you're going to do here today. Uh, we thank you for the hearing of the word. Lord, prick our hearts, oh Lord, that we may receive conviction. I'm praying for those that don't know you, but it's those that do, oh Father God, that change may happen in their life and manifestation. Oh Lord, for the better of them. And the Lord, that after hearing this word, their life will no longer be the same. Thank you, Father God, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for the sins we commit, known or unknown, before you in your presence. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Praise God. I had a, um, a vision God had showed me, and it was something so simple, something I do every day. Um, God showed me, he had me, I was taking my water bottle to the water fountain to get some water, and uh, God began to speak to me right there in that message. And um, he says, as I was going to the water fountain, he says, Q, I want you to be able to find something that I can put something precious in, something I can you know, pour something into. He says, first, you have to be able to find the vessel. And I begin to understand what God was saying, because when we, when we want to put water, we want to put something in something, we first have to be able to find the vessel. Meaning that if I want to, how many of you guys take an empty container and you take and put water in it, or you put some type of substance in it, but to, in order to uh, put, in order to be able to place something in something, you must find the vessel first. And what God was saying is basically he wants us to be able to find he wanted me to be able to find a bottle, a bottle that was worthy enough to be able to pour into what he wanted me to pour into it. As I would do my water jug on a daily basis, I take my water jug and I would replenish it and I would take it and I would re I would refill in it. Oh, okay. So um, God, God was showing me that. So I began to go to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter one, chapter five, uh, verse five says this. It said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. So this is what God was saying as I had the water bottle in my hand. God says also too, is that I want you to find something I can pour into. But when I begin to realize the teaching of what God was saying, God was using me as the water bottle. Mm -hmm. God was saying that, can this water bottle hold what I'm getting ready to pour into it? Now, when I have a water bottle, I have anything, in order to make sure that it can hold that which I'm getting ready to pour into it, I must first do a test first. I must run water into it to see if it can hold the very thing that I want to pour into it. And if not, I will probably get rid of it. But God said, don't get rid of it. I have a way that I can seal it. And I begin to understand the teaching of God. God says, before I pour into you, I must make sure that you can hold the very thing that I'm trying to pour into you. Because if not, it's just going to leak out and it's going to waste all over the place. God says, I have to make sure that you're healed. I have to make sure that you're not broken. I have to make sure that you don't have any unforgiveness. I have to make sure that all those things are intact. Because those things create little holes in your life. And those things will spill out. I remember one time, one New Year's service. 
we did a message, but I took the styrofoam cup and I punched little uh, fine holes in it with the needle. You could not see the holes in it, but when you begin to pour the water in it, you can see all the water begin to uh, screw out through the places where the holes were. And God was showing me, he says, listen, a lot of people you are asking me for things that they're not ready for. It's not that I can't give it. The thing is, I don't want to give it and have it be able to go to waste because it's going to be able to spill out. So God says in the process of time, what I am doing is sealing up the little holes. Yeah. The other day I had a, um, my tire pressure sensor came on and I went to the tire place to you know, get a tire and the guy says, listen, I plugged this same tire before. He says, now what's happened, I found out is that I have to plug it from the inside because it's causing air to be able to leak out and that's causing your tire pressure sensor to come on because the air is leaking out so I have to plug it from the inside. Meaning this time you plugged, last time you plugged it, he says, this time I have to patch it and the patch will stop everything from seeping out. God was showing me that the patch in the tire represents to us wounds and things that we have in our life that we have not yet been healed of. So God says, when I begin to pull my spirit or try to give you something that you want, you end up losing it because of the holes that you have in your life. How many times have God given us certain things? And we just taught this last week. He said, well and done, good and faithful servant. When he talked about, he gave um, some five talents, some two talents, some one talents. And God was showing us that it's not that God hasn't blessed us. Some of us know and look back and see that God has blessed me. It's just that I've let some of the things that God has given me get away. Yeah. I, I've let my life is getting spiraled out of control. It's not that God has not blessed me. It's just that I don't have the ability to be able to hold on to that which he has given me. And then I find myself trying to keep some of the things that God has given me. And I'm praying for God to keep it. God says, don't pray to be able to keep it. Pray that I am able to heal you so that you can be able to sustain and be able to maintain it. Yeah. God says, what's the need of you grasping for things and trying to keep everything in when you don't have the ability to be able to hold it? Mm -hmm. I was reading something the other day. I think it was on the styrofoam cup or something I had. And it says, you know what? This particular vessel could not hold heat up into a certain amount of degrees. And I begin to understand, basically saying that, listen, if you pour something that's too hot in it, the cup is going to crumble because the cup is not made for it. It has to be made for that. Notice most of your thermos and your coffee cups and things like that, they are created to be able to hold something with a high degrees. It's created that way. It's created to be able to hold. So God was showing me, he says, listen, I, and first and foremost, when you're trying to, when I'm finding the vessel that can hold it, before I pour into that vessel, I must make sure that that vessel can definitely hold it, regardless of what temperature it may be. The Bible tells us to be ready in season and out of season. Amen. Amen. You know, he says, he talks about us being hot versus cold. He says, if you look warm, he'll, he'll spit you out. God says, you have to have the ability to be able to hold what I'll pour into you. But before I do the pouring, I must make sure that you can hold it. So that means I must be able to seal it first. God says, cue the people and even you are asking for things that's just going to get away from you. I went back to the prodigal son. I said, well, God, you gave it to the prodigal son. You allowed the prodigal son to be able to have some things that got away from him too. God says, I want you to understand, if you go back to the teaching of the prodigal son, he says that I gave him a portion of his inheritance. God bless me right there. He says, I gave him just enough if there was a measurement of grace that he couldn't get past the measurement of grace, if you understand what I'm saying. I gave him enough to get away from me, but not enough to get too far away. Understand what God was doing right there. God gives you sometimes what you want, allow you to have it, allow it to be able to teach you. I've been reading things lately that says experience is the best teacher. God has given me some things that's going to help and that's going to teach me, but he doesn't allow it to get me too far away from him where I can't come back. That's right. yeah. God says the difference between him and the devil, God says I will never give you something to OD. Understand what I'm saying? God says, I will allow you to have what you have, but I will never give you enough to be able to OD. He says, what the devil would do, he will give you enough to be able to OD. I didn't understand what God was saying. Yeah. The devil will give you enough to OD. God gives you a prescription. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. 
You, when you go to a doctor, your doctor don't give you enough to OD. He prescribes you enough. But the devil will give you the highest doses possible because yeah. he doesn't care what happens to you. But God gives you a prescription. Yeah. Something specifically for you. Not for nobody else. Not Something specifically for you. God says that I have to first be able to choose the vessel. Go to the book of John chapter 15. We're going to talk about the choosing of it first. Hopefully I can be able to get through this. John chapter 15, and I want to take your attentions to the cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the branches and you are the vine. Who abides in me and I abide in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. The scripture I basically was looking for, I, I, it, it was here in, uh, no matter of fact, verse 19, I apologize. I wrote it down wrong. He says, if you were of the world, the world will love its own, yet because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So the scripture I was basically looking for that I written down is where God was saying that he had chosen them. Just like he said with Jeremiah, he said, before I formed thee, I knew thee, and I doing, and I ordained thee to be a prophet before the nations. So God was says, listen, once you choose the vessel, now you have to make sure the vessel can hold the very things what it is. So he took me back to Jeremiah chapter 18 with the prodigal son. I'm not the prodigal son. With the potter and the clay. And I remember what God was saying. He says, with the potter and the clay, he says, listen, oh Israel, can't I do the same thing with you as the potter does with the clay? And what he was showing him, he says that he could remake the vessel. Now, if a vessel has to be uh, remade, that means that it was perfectly made before. What God was saying about his people that they were fearfully and wonderfully made, but during the course of the time that his people had gotten away from him, they need to have a, re a makeover. God recognized that when we get away from him and we come back to him, that he has to be able to what? Uh, recreate us. He has to reform us. He has to change us. He has to seal us up. There's alignments and things that have to be done. So when God was taking me back to the scripture, I'll be able to understand. He says the sealing place that has to be done has to take place first. For, first. Then he took me to John chapter 4. Go to John 4. Remember the story with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And Jesus in verse in chapter 4, verse 7, the woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus says, If you knew the gift of God and who it says to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman says to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Now, the lady is a vessel wanting Jesus to pour something into her. But Jesus says... You have something in your life that's going to mess up me, that's going to stop the best, it's going to basically um, cause issues with me pouring into your life. So he's, listen, you're holding on to a husband that's not yours, and in order for you to be able to get the Holy Spirit, which he was teaching here, poured inside of you, I need you to go and get the husband that is not yours fix that situation, and then I can pour it to you. Because by you trying to hold on to something that doesn't belong to you, you won't be able to, be, you'll never be able to receive or hold on to what I'm trying to give to you. Yeah. So what Jesus told her to get, told her to do, he says, listen, I want you to go get what you're holding on to. 
bring that to me, and then I'm going to have you to be able to let that go, and I'm going to pour into you what you're supposed to have. But when he told the woman to go get her husband, the first thing she did is begin to make excuses. Because why? She didn't want to let go of what she had. And there was everybody been saying, yes, the spirit of, lately the Spirit of God was saying, in order to be able to get something, you have to be able to let something go. She didn't want to let it go, but she wanted something else. She wanted the living water, which was the Holy Spirit that Jesus was trying to give her, but she didn't want to let go that what she had. Yeah. And Jesus says, you got to go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And he, she says that, he said, you've had five husbands. The man you have now is not your husband. Jesus basically said, listen, I need you to go and fix that situation in order for me to be able to pour into you. The second thing God was showing me is this. Once we go through all that, if the woman lets the, lets the man go, there has to be a cleansing. If I do find a vessel, if I find a water bottle, I find something to pour it in. Once I find something that can go inside of it, the next thing is to do is to be able to clean it up. Right? Because though it may be able to hold, it still has to be clean. So he took me to Psalm 51. You don't have to take it for the sake of time. Psalm 51 is King David saying, Lord, created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. In order for God to be able to use the vessel, God has to be able to clean the vessel out. He also says in the uh, book of John 1 and 9, he says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So first and foremost, what I have to do, if I want God to be able to clean my vessel, a lot of people don't understand God has to have permission to clean your vessel. Your, the, the permission of God to clean the vessel starts off with repentance. Me confessing sin, asking God to forgive me for my sins, and then that gives God permission to be able to come in to be able to clean up. Notice this is that the Bible talks about the unclean spirit going out of the man. It talks about the house being clean and swept, but we see the house can be clean and swept, but the unclean spirits can still come back. So God says, I need not only permission to be able to, to clean, I need permission to be able to be Lord. Because God says a clean house doesn't rep always represent that there's a landlord there or ownership there. So a lot of people want to eat clean, want to be clean, and cleanliness is next to godliness, have a clean temple, look clean, but still doesn't have a Lord. And that's why you have to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior means that I'm giving him authority over my temple. And that's why he says, listen, we are the temple of the living God. If anybody defile the temple of God, that God shall destroy him. So I have to give God not only permission to clean my temple, but I have to give uh, God power, attorney, and authority over my temple to be able to keep it and to be able to guard it. So I ask God to clean me up with his permission. Daily on a daily basis, I'm confessing. God was showing me something the other day. I think I was joking about this. You know how you... You, you, you wash dishes and you put the solution in. And the thing is that in order to be able to get the solution out and the very dirt that's in there, it's a continual pouring and rinsing out till all of it is gone. It's a continual cleansing and rinsing out. So what does that represent? It's on a daily basis, God, though we are saved, God is constantly cleaning us up. Um, you hear a lot of Christians say, I'm under construction. God is working on me. The Bible says, how shall a young man cleanse his way? It says by taking heed according to his word. So daily, on a daily basis, though I'm reading the word of God, God is cleaning me up. He's helping to fix some of the things that send me. So Christians are not perfect. On a daily basis, we're reading the word of God so God can be able to clean us up to help us to fix the things about ourselves that we don't like. When I say don't like, I'm talking about not the things that people don't like. I'm saying that when you look into the word of God, God will show you on on a, on a personal basis yep. things that you need to change. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let me teach you something I've learned, right? Yeah. Don't be so quick to change what people say you need oh, to change. Yeah. Change what God has shown you that need to be changed. Yeah. Because people only see <laughs> the surface of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. they, they don't see what's going on internally. Yeah. You notice, a lot of times you say, listen, what you see on the surface is basically because of something I'm dealing with etern internally. That's what people tell you now. That, Listen, I want to apologize for it because I'm just dealing with something and it caused me to lash out on you. So you say, you know what? I need to fix what's going on inside because it's spilling over on other things. I read something the other day. Somebody said that um, if, you, if you get cut 
um, and you don't heal, you end up bleeding all over, over the people that's trying to help you. You know, one of my one of my favorite stories a guy told me he says, um, he uh, I was he that did it or a guy hit a deer, and he tried to get out of his vehicle and help the deer, and because the deer didn't understand he was trying to help, the deer ended up kicking him out of fear, and people will, a lot of times when you're hurt, you will hurt other people, yeah. not knowing that somebody's actually trying to help you, but right. you're, you're trying to protect yourself. Right. You know, it's always amazing when you, when you go to the doctor and the doctor comes in the room and as soon as he comes in the room, he either puts his gloves on, he sanitizes, he sanitizes his hand when he goes in, he sanitizes his hands when he goes out. And everybody, it, it sounds simple to why he does it, but let me tell you a great teaching about it. When he comes in, he sanitizes his hand to protect you from whatever place he just came from. Right? Mm -hmm. Then, when he leaves your room, sanitizes his hands again to remove everything from where he just came from to go somewhere else. That's, that's like how ministry is. You know, every, every, every time we go places, we have to make sure on a daily basis, I'm trying to make sure I don't take home to work, and I don't take work home, yeah. and I don't take my past into my future. Yeah. Amen. And that's a hard Amen. thing to be able to do on a daily basis. Amen. I go to work trying not to take home to work. Yeah. Stuff happened at work, trying not to take that home. Uh, and trying not to make what has happened in, in my past yeah. bring it up to date into my future. Yeah. Yeah. So God has talked about the cleansing there. God says, once you've done all the process of the cleansing, you, he says, now, Q, it's time to fill the water bottle. Of a, of a great teaching, God was showing me this, man. I don't know when you fill it up, a water bottle. God was showing me this. Listen, you have to be able to have a steady hand. You have to be able to keep it still. And one of the key scriptures that came about when God was saying that, he says, um, be still and know that I'm God. God says, sometimes, you the people don't sit still long enough for me to pour into them what they're supposed to have. Yeah, amen. He said, they don't, they don't sit still long enough. And the thing about it is, is that if they're not sitting still, that means that they can't get what I'm trying to get to them. You know, the thing about it is, is that sometimes we'll pray, and this was sent to me this morning, we'll pray, but then we don't listen. We pray and expect God to listen. We pray and then we move, but then we never really sit back to listen to see what God said. Yeah. We don't sit still long enough to be able to receive what God is saying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, the thing about it is, is that even with Jesus not hearing from God and still understanding what I learned is from Jesus, uh, praying that God would remove the cup that he had, right? Praying that God would remove the cup that he had. And God did not do that. But when he did not hear from God, after praying three different times about it, he just stayed with the course. You know, being able to understand too that what God had, what Jesus was basically teaching us is that if God is not saying anything, that means you're right where you're supposed to be. Now, a lot of us, if God is not saying anything, Maybe I'll go to a different pastor. I'll go to a different church. I'll go different places until I get the answer I want. Yeah. But a lot of times when God is not saying anything, that means you are not all right where we are, are supposed to be. Yeah. But a lot of times what we'll do as people, we'll seek out different things. We'll seek out different places to be able to go until we get an answer from God. That's what we'll do. We'll go to, you know, a lot of people, if they don't get the answer they want from me, they'll go to another pastor or they'll turn on something until they get the answer that they want. And sometimes it's not about you getting the answer um, that God has said. You want the answer that agrees with what you want God to do. And you have to watch that because if you are looking to hear a word from the Lord, but God has not spoken, There's a, there are people out there that will give you a word that's in agreement with what you want to hear. Yeah. There are teachings out there like that. Yeah. Amen. There, are there are people who will tell you what you want to hear. You have friends, you have ministries, and people are telling people right now what they want to hear, and they'll tell you, listen, 
if you want to hear what God is doing, fast. Fast is not all about hearing what God is doing. Fast is about bringing the flesh under subjection. God can, God can speak to you what he needs to do without the fast. I'm not telling you to fast, but there's a lot of people saying, I need to fast to be able to hear what God is doing. You no, know, a lot of times the flesh is the fast is to be able to bring the flesh under subjection and to be able to teach you discipline and obedience over your flesh so that you're not moving when you're not supposed to be moving and that allowing God to do what he has to do in the process of where you are and not getting up and moving. We don't sit still long enough to allow God to be able to perform the thing that he needs to perform. He says, what created me a clean heart, renewed by spirit that's within me. Yeah. We, don't, we don't sit still enough, uh, long enough to be able to allow God to be able to uh, do what he has to do. He says, and uh, I think it was Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, um, Jesus walked by the sea of Galilee and two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother, he saw them casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will make you a fisherman of men. I mean, and one of the famous saying people know I say all the time is that God told you and I to catch the fish. He didn't tell us to clean them up. That's God's job. That's God's job to be able to, um, once we get caught for some plants on water, but God does, does the, uh, gives the increase. It's God's job to be able to clean up and do what he has to do. He says, fill it. Go to John chapter 2. Stay right there. You were right there in the book of John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Look at the popular story. John chapter 2 verse 2. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus wasn't being disrespectful to his mother, but he was basically letting her know that it wasn't time for him. It wasn't his hour to be doing miracles. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he says to you to do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone and according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons of peace. Now listen, this is, this is what the Bible is saying. The, the pats or the stones were already holding something, right? Get blessed with what God is doing right here. You could be holding something for God, but it takes God to be able to change it. The pots were already holding water. Here's a teaching where Jesus is going to turn water into wine. But notice this, it was already holding the water already. So Jesus said, listen, if it's already holding the water, then I can go ahead and turn it to wine. But I can't turn it to wine if it's not already able to hold the water. But I see it's already to hold the water. How does he know it's already hold the water? Because it's already been faithful in holding what's already in it. Yeah. Notice he says that. When the servant comes, when he gives the gifts and talent to the servants and he comes back to see the condition or what they have done with the talents, he, he's seen the one with five turned to ten, the one who had two turned to four, and the one who had one did nothing in it but buried it. God says, first and foremost, I'll give you something to see how you hold that, and then I'll take what you already have and change it. Amen. I'll turn the water into wine. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are vessels that Jesus is teaching that is showing us here that his um, he takes the water and um, make, it turns into wine. But the pots were already filled with water. He's just going to change it into something else. Now here, now here, what is God talking about here? The Bible says what? Created me a clean heart, renewed by spirit with us. He said he's given us beauty for ashes. He said he's, he's washed us and made us whiter than snow. He says that he that is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, old things pass away, all things become new. That means that he took something and changed it into something else. The water into wine is a representation of you having the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a representation of water, and then it changes to wine. Why wine? Wine is one of the very few things that gets better with time. It's one of the few things that as it ages, it doesn't get worse, it gets better. God says, but once I have the vessel and I have my Holy Spirit or have that water in it, then if it's holding the water, then I know it can hold the wine. 
That's what God. But then somebody comes back and says, well, that's what God says. He's not going to put um, new wine in old wineskins. Yeah. Hold up. So what is God? Is there's a greater teaching that too? It's because, yeah, God can do a new wine, but he's definitely got, not going to put it into something old. So he has to be able to make sure you and I are what? New. Because only a new person can handle something new from God. But the thing is, we have people with their old nature asking for things of God, but have a old nature. God says, you have the nature that you have will not be able to house the spiritual thing or the new thing I'm getting ready to do. So what God says, I, I have to be able to shape and mold you. I have to be able to fix you for the very thing that you're asking for. Everybody's asking God for something, but don't nobody want to go through the preparation of that which you're asking for. I'm asking for it, but I don't want to be prepared for it. We're saying, God, do it right now. God says, I am doing it right now, but I'm preparing you. So that's what God does. And what and, and somebody told me a long time ago, they say, Q, never, never pray for patience. Because the more patience you pray for, the more tribulation or adversity you get. Why does God do that? Well, here's his great teaching, right? It takes time to develop you, right? Uh -huh. So God has a way of creating what we like to call setbacks. But setbacks in a cliche is a setup for a comeback. Yeah. So God says, I need to be able to delay you or create time and space to be able to do that which I need to do. Perfect thing. You've heard me preach this before. I'll make it plain and simple. The restaurant, when they take your order, needs to be able to preoccupy you until the food comes. So what do they give you? Bread. Bread. In the wilderness, right? God said that he was trying to take them from Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. What did he give them? Bread. Bread. Man. To sustain them. To maintain them. Now, unless it's red lobster, the bread is not supposed to be better than the entree. Not supposed to be. The bread is just supposed to hold you over until the entree comes. But you and I fail to realize that with so much of the bread and the water is spreading in your belly, you no longer want your food anymore. So therefore, the bread has the ability to stop you from wanting the entree. Yes. Yes. That's a good and a bad thing in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. The good part of it is, if I have so much bread, I heard a joke the other day, a guy said, what the real life ate so much bread, he didn't even order his food. <laughs> he just ate bread and, and the water, and I don't even know if he even owed him for that. Maybe he owed him for the drink, but he said he had so much bread and water, he didn't want his food no more. The blessed part of that is, <laughs> If you recognize the healing power that's inside of the bread, the bread meaning inside of the manna, you will know that if I have the bread first, the bread will heal me and the bread will heal the reason why I'm asking for what I'm asking for. Why, what do you get that from? James chapter one, James, James chapter four says what? We have not because we ask not, but we have not because we ask amiss that we may receive upon our own selfish lusts. God says, the motive behind your asking is a hurt, a pain, a insecurity, or something that you're dealing with. So you're asking for something to fulfill something in you that's broken. So God says, this is what I'll do. I'll give you bread. I'll give you adversity. I'll allow things to continue to happen, which is considered to be setbacks. But God says, doing the things that I'm giving you, the tribulations and things that seem like setbacks, what I'm doing is creating time of healing. So when you do get to the place you're supposed to be, you're able to, able to have it and to maintain it because I took you through so many different things. And you're not understanding what I'm doing is creating traffic, get blessed, yeah. God creates traffic yeah. for you to sit in. Amen. Amen. 
This is God. This is, this is how he works. God says, I'm going to create traffic for you. I know what time you're supposed to be there, but I'm going to create traffic because your attitude is going to be better. Come on, get blessed. That doesn't always work. Normally, I'm going to be upset when I get to the place late. God says, it's something that I'm going to do during the traffic. Yeah, I'm going to make you grateful. I'm going to make you wait. Doing traffic, I'm going to make you realize that, guess what? There's nothing you can do about it. What if I just forced you to do in traffic? I forced you to wait. I can't drive over the cars. I can't go around the middle. I have to wait. My biggest thing in life is that I don't know when to get off the exit or stay in traffic. Because sometimes I feel like the traffic is just some, I found out that if I sat long enough, it was just a few people rubbernecking and within two, three minutes, the traffic's going to pick up. And sometimes I found out I have gotten off on the exit and made my commute a lot longer. Yeah. Yep. The thing with the believer is learning when to sit in traffic and when to get off. Yeah. Then, you, then you have to be able to say to yourself, you know what? Is this, if it's, if it's God, right? It's okay if I sit. Because whatever's there is going to be there when I get there. How many times you got people that speed past you and end up at the same light as you? Yes, yes, yes. Look over like the Kermit the Frog, like, what, you know, what are you, what are you doing? You sped past me, they end up in the same place. Going nowhere fast. You know what God was showing you right there? Don't focus on the people who are passing you, story of the tortoise and the hare, because you're basically going to end up at the same light. No matter how fast you get it, I'm going to get it too in my season. Yeah. I'm not a Black Friday shopper. If you are, I don't have nothing against it. But what I've learned about Black Friday is people are paying the right price <laughs> that it was actually worth the day after things. Guess what? It was worth the whole time. Black Friday is basically the store saying, I couldn't get from you during a year the markup, so now I'm going to give it to you for what it's really worth. It's still not worth that. What does Black Friday represent in the spiritual sense? Black Friday is God's way of saying, though God has nothing to do with Black Friday, this is just all we use in my knowledge and spiritual teaching. I'm not saying that God has anything to do with Black Friday. So I want everybody to repost that. Repost that. What I'm saying is that somebody paid for something, a lot more for something that had it faster or sooner than me because it's something about being the first person to have something. <laughs> PlayStation is now 200, used to be 500. You bought it for five, now I get to get it for two, with four, three or four games, and I'm, I'm, better, I'm winning with that. Yeah. That's because I waited. TV that was marked up, marked all the way down. That was his real worth. The devil, Jesus talked about the devil saying that all this I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Yeah. Um, um, the, what, what, what the devil knows is that he knows what God has for you. So he's saying I can offer you the same thing with a higher interest rate. The same thing. With a higher interest rate. Meaning that I just want to get you to pay more for what God has for you. Yeah. Let me teach you this. Everybody in the room, not everybody in this room have some of the same things, right? Believe it or not, the difference is everybody has paid different prices for them. And sometimes people know you by what you pay for your stuff. Get blessed. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good thing and a bad thing. People know you about what you pay for, what you have. God says, well, if you wait for it long enough, I'll, I'll make it so that you get it for what it's worth and it won't cost you a whole lot. Thank you, Lord. 
Esau could not wait, therefore he sold his birthright unto Jacob because at the time he was more hungry than what he felt his inheritance was worth. Sometimes Jesus says, listen, those who come to me says, well, never thirst and they should never hunger. What he was talking about also too is people being in a hurry to be able to possess things. So he says, what I do, I give you bread because there's a reason why you thirst. There's a reason why you're hungry. He's not talking about spiritual at that. I mean, not physical, physical at that talk point. He's talking about spiritual. He said, there's a reason why you desire to have that thing so bad. Yeah. And God says, guess what? If I give it to you, then I give into your lust. Mm -hmm. The thing we do, I watched the other day, I was in the store, and a kid was crying, and the mother just told the other kids, just give the baby whatever he wanted to make him stop crying. Give him your keys. Give him your phone. He wanted the necklace. He just wanted everything. And never stopped crying. Next thing you know, the baby has a shopping cart full of the keys, the cell phone, the necklace, and his toys. What's in the cart? Everybody else's stuff. And guess why he's crying? You need to be changed. Somebody get that. <laughs> I'm not talking about his diaper. Why is the baby crying? Because the baby needs to be changed. The heart. That's why it's crying. For you. Sometimes you, the baby's crying because he's dealing with his own demons. Yeah. Dealing with his own spiritual battles. Mm -hmm. So he's crying and asking for everything because I don't know how to deal with what's going on inside. Mm -hmm. And when people can't deal with what's going on inside, they tend to want everything. Why are they asking? They're asking to help them get their mind off what's going on inside. Yeah. Just need something to take my mind off of what's going on inside. Yeah. Amen. He says, You have not because you ask not. But you have that because you ask amiss that you may receive these things upon your own selfish lust. He says, I'm not going to give them to you. Why? Because it's not even a need. It's a want. But guess what God will do? He's, so, he's, so, he's like this. God will not give you something because you're broken, but heal you, then give it back to you. Yeah. That's God. Amen. He'll do it that way. It's an order of it. He says, if I give you something, why you broken, you never get healed. But if I heal you first and give you something, even if you lose it, you still have your healing. Yeah, amen. 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 So what God was showing me with that is that you ever notice that you have something. God take it away, it reveals your brokenness. But if you're healed and God takes something away from you, you see an individual still able to sing. Yeah. A story of Job that a lot of people fail to realize and miss. Job was blessed with every, everything that God gave. This here's, here's a blessing, right? Job got blessed so much that he became fearful about what he had. That's not supposed to happen. But it does happen. God blesses an individual with so much and fear creeps in. Why does fear creep, fear creep in? Fear creep in because I don't want to go back to living without what I have. That's a fear. God has a way of doing things that God says that you have to be able to receive a blessing from me but still love me more than it. Or I'm going to ask for it back. Yes. Abraham, you asked for Isaac. I, I told you I was going to give you Isaac. I gave you Isaac. And now I'm asking for it back. Because you've changed. You're not the same any longer. So I need Isaac back. And if I get Isaac back, I bring you back to the place before you asked for it. But until I ask for Isaac back, you were off doing your own thing. Yeah. 
So why did I ask for Isaac back? I asked for Isaac back to call you to a place where you're back in my face, where you have to seek me again. Yeah. Why is God taking my stuff? Nope. He, see, here's the thing about it is, is that if you, I know when I used to, and I'm not calling anybody a dog, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You know, you take, a, you take something and you put it on the string in your house and you pull it. Your dog will run after it. See something moving on the floor, you want to chase it. And you pull it to you. God says, what I do, I put a string, invisible string, on your stuff. I pull it unto me. Guess who's going to follow? You. Yeah. Me. Whatever God puts on that string and pulls to him, he'll pull you right along with it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man is drawn away, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. God got a string, guess who got a string too? Devil got a string. Which one you gonna chase? Both strings being pulled. Wisdom says, you know what? To get both of them strings. Because what I'm going to have should be tied up for me. Jesus told them, he said, listen, I want you to go into the city. And it's going to be a donkey in that city. And it's going to be tied up. Wait. And if anybody asks you, what are you doing untying the donkey? Say that the master has need of the donkey. Whatever I have loosed, you know the scripture, in heaven shall be loosed on earth. Whatever I bound in heaven shall be bound on earth. What, what, what does that mean, Pastor Stewart, in so many words? Well, if you know the Old Testament, the Old Testament already told you that that donkey was going to be there for him, for him to ride on. Yes, it so those that don't agree with the Old Testament, if you, you you can't dispute it because the same donkey he said he was going to ride into um, ride, ride, um, ride into ride, in, ride into the city with from the Old Testament was sitting there in the New Testament. Let me make it plain. That means that the Old Testament of my life before I knew Christ, God can make me a promise for something. Before I was tied unto him or bound unto him and come over to the new life and it still be tied up for me. Yeah. I mean, God can show me something when I'm not close to him, when I'm not in his service, something he want to do. And it still be there when I get there because it's tied and loose for me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to chase it. It's already tied. Yeah. And when it's tied, that means that it only can be loose. Notice what Jesus said. He said, if anybody say to you, what need do you have with the donkey? He said, tell them that the master has need of it. That's, yeah. that's, that's approval right there. Yeah. He told them to fill the water pots and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, draw some out now and take to the master of the feast. Notice this. Once I feel something, and once God changes it, right then and there, you know what God can do? Once it's changed, now he can draw from it. But not till it's changed. You know, the thing about it is, is that we want to pour into so many people. But the Bible says that how can bitter and sweet water come from the same fountain? You ever go to the store and put your cup under the dispenser to get Sprite or Pepsi and it tastes like something's off? Yeah. yeah. That's what God says we are when we haven't been fully changed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let me finish this. So God is still dealing with the cup very close. Keeping a steady hand so that you can fill it. But this is what God says also, right? I have Mashallah to uh, read the scripture. Notice this, that 
when you're filling up something, there's this thing I like to call it a catcher. I'm pretty sure there's another name for it. For it. But when, when you when you go to places, you go to cookouts and stuff like that. Notice that they have something set up that when you're when you're pouring out something, it catches the overflow, so it doesn't spill on the floor, right? The overflow, the catcher. Um, Jesus Jesus told the Canaanite woman, He says, "I cannot give um, the, the children's bread to the dogs." But guess what she said? Yeah, Lord, but even the crumb from the table falls off into the dogs. Yeah. He, he was teaching right there is that, you know what, I'll bless you in a way of an overflow that the overflow is not just for you. It's for those who are connected to you that will be blessed as well. The Jews, the Jews didn't deal with the Canaanites. He wasn't calling people dogs. Jesus, Jesus was using a metaphor showing how precious the word of God was because she wanted healing. Showing how precious it was. And then when he, he said, listen, but you know, the Canaanites, they're not that worthy of this. But then he began to teach the people also too that the um, it wasn't just the bread or the word of God was not just for the Israelites that it was going to be for the yeah. Gentiles as well. Yeah. Because the Jews are sinful, like since they're the chosen people, that the word of God wasn't for the Gentiles. But right there, he was teaching also. Somebody didn't understand what that scripture meant. So, after that, he says, Once I have filled the cup, and Mashana read it in uh, Psalm 23 5, the favorite, the most powerful scripture, he says, My cup runneth over. God did all this to this vessel that he may cleanse it, shake it up, I mean that he may cleanse it, wash it out, and that it may be able to what? Overflow into what? Somebody else's cup. God did all this so that I'm able to be able to take what he has put inside of me to be able to pour into someone else. You know the last scripture I'm going to give and then I'll uh, close. It, 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 it actually just ties all this in. I think it's in Luke 6 30, 38 says this he says give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you wow God says taking everything that I've given you I've poured into your blessing." I mean, I poured into your bosom and be able to give it back. So when you, I'm going to show the Bible, when, when, you, when you think about everything that God is doing in, in your life right now, um, you look at Me Too movements and you look at God, everything that God has allowed to be able to go and allow you to be able to go through. He's poured into you strength. He's poured into you so many different things. And so that the things that you and I are going through, we may pour into somebody else. Only way that you and I can pour into somebody else if we have basically experienced what they experienced. Jesus told Peter, Satan have desired to sift thee as we, but I sift thee as we, but I have already prayed for you that your faith remain, but when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. So God says, when I pour inside of you, I'm pouring into you so that you may pour into somebody else. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for blessings and keeping us in all things. Praying, oh Father God, that your word was able to get home and change hearts and minds, Lord, in Jesus' name. I'm the voice, Pastor Q. We thank all you guys for tuning to our broadcast today. You guys be blessed. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise.